Now, Napoleon seized power during the War of the Second Coalition, but due to British policy soon after Napoleon claimed power, Russia and Prussia left the war and formed the League of Neutrality with Denmark. Britain attacked Denmark, forcing it to leave the League and side with France, and the war ended in 1802 with Napoleon bringing Switzerland and Tuscany under his influence. In the Americas, though, France had seen less success, with the Haitian Revolution and being forced to sell Louisiana on the cheap to the US. Napoleon in 1804 declared himself Emperor of the French. Not of France, mind you, of the French. Soon after, Sweden broke off ties with France and sided with its enemy, Britain, forming the Third Coalition. Napoleon planned to invade Britain to end their rivalry once and for all, but Britannia rules of the waves and France navies were crushed by the British. On land though, Napoleon was unstoppable, occupying Vienna and crushing the Austrian and Russian armies, forcing their surrender. The Holy Roman Empire was dissolved, the Italian peninsula was unified at the Kingdom of Italy under Napoleon's control, and he reorganized the German states into a more manageable Confederation of the Rhine. Napoleon's conquering of the German states worried Prussia, who formed the Force Coalition in 1806. This time, Austria wasn't having it, and retired to neutrality, allowing Prussia to be swiftly defeated in a year. In the peace terms, Napoleon expanded his German holdings and formed the Duchy of Warsaw. Russia switched sides and declared war on the British-friendly Sweden, leaving them out of the Fifth Coalition. Napoleon, ruling or influencing about all of Europe, formed the Continental System, demanding all European countries cease trade with Britain. The British linked up with the Spanish rebels in an attempt to create a holding on the continent. This failed though. Austria attempted to capitalize on this and create the Fifth Coalition. They didn't even hold out a year. Russia was suffering by not being able to trade with Britain and pulled out of the Continental System. Napoleon, in response, put together an army of 500,000 and marched into Russia. Russia employed a scorched earth policy, burning farms, blocking wells and destroying towns as they retreated to Moscow. Napoleon's forces lived off the land and relied very little on supply lines. This strategy once allowed them to zip across the continent, winning many battles and wars, but now it would backfire. Napoleon reached Moscow and it was burning. His forces entered the barren city and waited for a Russian surrender that would never come. His army retreated in the Russian winter on the same path they came, and many of his soldiers died in the snow. The Russians pursued Napoleon's armies, and other nations saw this as a chance to rise up. The Thix Coalition was formed and Napoleon was defeated at Leipzig in 1813, and the Coalition's forces pushed into Paris. Napoleon was exiled to an island near Italy, but he escaped. He returned and amassed an army of loyal supporters. Sometimes French armies would be sent to apprehend him, but they refused and defected upon witnessing him. The Seventh Coalition was formed in response. Napoleon planned to defeat his enemies at Waterloo and from a position of power, sue for peace. Unfortunately for Napoleon, his plans failed and the British and Prussian forces in Waterloo defeated him. He was exiled to St. Helena in the Atlantic Ocean, where he died. The Coalition restored the Bourbon monarchy and placed Louis XVIII, Louis XVI's younger brother, on the throne. What happened to Louis XVII, you may be asking? He was the 16th son and died in prison at age 10 in 1795. The new monarchy was not the same as the old though. This was a constitutional monarchy, which if you remember was the original idea the National Assembly had in 1789. Louis XVIII died in 1824 childless. Luckily, another younger brother, Charles X, was placed on the throne. In 1830, we had the second French Revolution, the July Revolution. It was successful, but oddly enough did not put in place a second republic, but instead placed Charles' cousin, the Duke of Orleans, Louis-Philippe I, on the throne. Not two years later, in 1832, we witnessed another rebellion. The economy was poor and disease bewitched the lower socio-economic classes, as it does. With the death of popular politician Jean-Maximilien Lemarque, his funeral served as a catalyst for the June Rebellion, canonized in the climax of Les Miserables. If you've seen or read Les Mis, you'll know this rebellion was unsuccessful, so it is not given the title of the Third French Revolution. For the third one, we'll have to go to 1848, which removed the monarchy and introduced the Second Republic, and had the popular election of Napoleon's nephew, Napoleon III. So shortly we're done. The Second Republic is the France we have today. No, because old habits die hard, and in 1851 Napoleon III declared himself Emperor. To get to the Third Republic, we'll have to fast forward to 1866. Otto von Bismarck, President of Prussia, made so by King Wilhelm I, was leading the movement of German unification. 
Thanks to Napoleon's reorganization of the German states, this unification was made possible. Bismarck had turned on his early ally, Austria, and crushed them to take all of the northern German states under Prussian control. To unite the southern states, he would have to eliminate French influence in the region. Napoleon III wished to curb this Prussian threat and restore prestige to France on the continent. In a way, he wished to live up to his uncle. Due to a vacant throne in Spain, there was a chance of a Prussian-Spanish alliance. Napoleon III demanded that King Wilhelm make sure this not happen. Wilhelm would have complied had Napoleon not also demanded a letter of apology. Wilhelm allowed Bismarck to edit and publish this letter of demands in Prussia, and the people were furious. Bismarck continued to taunt the French knowing that if they declared war, the South German states would most likely join Prussia. In 1870, at the request of the people, France declared war. Prussia unified the German states at the North German Confederation to fight. Due to Bismarck's focus on military advancement, the French had no chance. The French army was crushed at the decisive Battle of Sedan, and Napoleon III himself was taken captive. When this news reached Paris, rebellions spread across the city, and the Third Republic was formed. The Prussians reached Paris and laid siege to the city. The new government minister managed to escape Paris by balloon, and set about forming a new army from the provisional capital in Tours. This army, though, was unable to break the siege, and by January 1871, the people in Paris had been reduced to eating cats and dogs. The princes of the German states gathered and declared Wilhelm Kaiser Wilhelm I of Germany, and Bismarck naturally became the Chancellor of Germany. Paris fell shortly after, and the two sides met to discuss peace. Unhappy with the terms, the Paris Commune, a revolutionary socialist government, took power in Paris. The Third Republic defeated the Paris Commune and took back the city as the capital in May. The Third Republic was left in power as a transitional government and was forced to pay reparations and cede land to the German Empire. The French never forgot this defeat and the ideology of revanchism, literally revenge, began and dominated French foreign policy for 40 years. This is why France became an ally to Britain and Russia despite historically being their rivals. But it is also part of why we had World War I and the subsequent wars of that. So there we have it, the Third Republic. Formed in defeat and supposed to be temporary was, ironically, the republic that lasted. Well, until World War II, when Germany occupied France and formed Vichy France and the other subsequent... Don't worry about it. The ideas and actions of France that happened in this time period still largely affect us to this day, and to discuss their entire impact... Well, it might be too soon to say. All I can do is offer my perspective as a young history buff, and hopefully inspire you to research this kind of stuff yourself, because I only scratch the surface here. Thank you all for watching. I've been thoroughly surprised with the response the first episode received as I was only expecting about 15 views. I'll keep trying to find the time to make these videos and put effort into them. Luckily enough, I have a holiday currently, but as school begins again, I can't promise these videos to come out as regularly as they do. So hopefully my viewer base will be able to tolerate this and stick with me. A big thank you to the people that are history as well. I probably would only have 15 views if it wasn't for the amount of people that came for there. And I'm going to stop waffling and just end the video here. Thank you. <laughs>